I think the fact that the world is getting more and more efficient mm. leaves you less and less places to hide. The older I get, the less I trust myself in positive decisions about people. Right? So we start building systems around that. The sign I'm looking for um, is the first AI that creates an AI better than a human created AI. Inilah Endgame. Halo teman-teman, hari ini kita kedatangan Peng Ong. Beliau adalah pimpinan dari Monk's Hill Ventures. Beliau juga um, foundernya dan teman dekat saya. Peng, so nice to graze our Likewise. You know, podcast. Talk about your early upbringing. You were born in Singapore. Talk about what sort of values were inculcated into you by the parents, by the broad ecosystem that you grew up in. Yeah. I think that that was the core. That's the, my fundamental operating system I, I got from my family coming up, growing up, uh, just hardworking, uh, being honest. Uh, my I come from a family of Christians, so uh, Christian missionaries, elders, etc. So those values just stuck with me all my life. You know, it's just fundamental operating system. Um, and... Um, It uh, also drove me through school. I was not a very um, sociable kind of kid. I was very, very introvert, which explains my engineering inclination, etc. cetera. And, um, but uh, that, that sense of mission to do something with your life, you know, was, was there from the beginning with my dad uh, bringing me up. Singapore is, is, touted as, is, is touted as one of the few places in the world where there is a lot of premium put on education. And then within the context of education, a lot of premium on empirical science. Yes. What role did your parents play in shaping you towards, you know, an empirical science field? I, I think uh, the deeper science part came from later on in yeah. grad school but but the the interest in intellectual pursuits came fairly, fairly early uh-huh. my my dad would give me a pocket money every week yeah but books didn't count i could buy any book and he'll pay for it wow yeah so i went crazy with books right so i kept reading books and this was i think my my introduction into the intellectual world you yeah. know I uh, started reading, of course, comics and all that stuff, but then progressed to books. How many, how many books were you reading on average in a month? Oh, I don't... <laughs> when I was a kid, I don't remember, maybe half uh, in a month, maybe one or two. Yeah. Okay. So not not that vigorous, but, you know, and there was all, all kinds of magazines and stuff like that. So my curiosity about the world was basically driven by my reading. Okay. You know, I've, I've been... <clears throat> speaking quite a lot about how our kids all over the world nowadays don't don't pick up the books the way you know maybe the earlier generations used to what what do you think can be done about that i, I think the core issue is not just reading i think reading introduces you to the world yeah but i think curiosity is is yeah. is the thing that's maybe driven out of kids because of I don't know, school work or, you know, just a busy schedule. You don't have time to play. And in fact, play is how you gain knowledge, not just knowledge, but high interest in acquiring knowledge about the world. I think the, the idea of curiosity and the idea of play has been maybe removed too much from our educational system. Right. So you result in kids that know how to memorize a whole bunch of stuff and regurgitate it in the exams. And they don't seem to be interested in almost anything. Yeah. Right. And that, that's very sad. Mm. You know, um, so, you know, we, we've, uh, we've even invested in companies that try to disrupt that kind of yeah. uh, mental mindset a bit. We'll, we'll talk about that. But yeah. talk about the role of your mom at home. Yeah. 
Was she, was she a big shaper of your uh, life journey? Uh, unfortunately, uh, she she was actually, but I lost her when I was about two and a half. Oh my! Yeah. Okay. So so Sorry it was that. it was a bit uh, um, of a learning uh, journey uh, because. I, I subsequently in high school made friends with uh, another guy that uh, Sun Ming is his name uh, that didn't ha- grew up basically with a dad and I realized how different our our characters were right I just couldn't read people I was not you know and I became conscious of that you know um, just a simple thing like saying as a boss you know good job right you yeah. know uh, took me a while to learn. Right, um, but I, I I think I figured out some of that. But my intuitive nature is still missing. I think the the softer side. It's not intuitive, right? You're you've named your company after the school you went to. Mm-hmm. Right? It's it's not like you know some of the other schools that you know many Singaporeans would proudly claim to have gone to. Yeah, talk about that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. M- Mangsil uh, Secondary School was the school I went to. Yeah, uh, and um, um, I didn't have as much of a choice because I didn't do as well in some of the subjects in 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 elementary school. So um, uh, I went to Mansell, and what I realized is that there's almost a a giving up of hope right. if you didn't make it to one of the top schools yeah. in 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 Singapore. Right, if you didn't come from like Raffles or ACS. Um, and what I realized is that that's almost a self-defeating kind of view of life, right? And, and one of the reasons uh, we took the name Mang Sil is to signal to folks, look, you know, you, you, where you come from doesn't matter that doesn't much. Matter. It's, it's how you think about the world, how you engage people. That's what makes great entrepreneurs, in fact, yeah. great people. Right? Yeah. Yeah. And um, there, there are other reasons like monks are, you know, both East and West were on the forefront of technology right. for many centuries. You know, serendipity. Yeah. So many reasons, but I think the core of which uh, is the sense of you can come from anywhere. Yeah. Kids, kids need to understand yeah, absolutely. that they're not boxed in. Yeah. When they're 16, 17, or 18. Yeah. You're, you're boxed in only if you let yourself be boxed. Yeah. In. Yeah. And and uh, when you are that young, you should feel free to explore. Yeah, yeah. Did did your father play a part in pushing you not to feel boxed in? Yeah, um, or it was more your friends and just yeah. a moment of serendipity. You woke up one morning, you wanted to defy yeah. the odds. My, my my dad was one of these uh, let let you run kind of guy, right? Uh, he he was clear what was important books right he gave me free yeah. flow books uh, and the other thing is he would give me uh, money for grades right <laughs> I like so, the incentive system yeah it's an incentive yeah. system it's all carrot right there's no yeah. stick I never had any that's stick. a great system yeah um, and um, I was just you know and he just show me a lot of interesting things in life you know he's a entrepreneur so he showed me his different businesses etc growing up so i i think the most i well i got a lot of um, learnings from my dad but i think probably the most important one was the sense of confidence that no matter what happens i can put food on the table mm. so i think you need at least that confidence if you were to start a company right because what happens if it doesn't work? Right? Yeah. So um, I think through thick and thin, I mean, this was Singapore in the 60s and 70s. It wasn't Singapore today, and you had ups and downs in the economy. And you could see as an entrepreneur, it's not so easy. Right? But he always had food on the table for us. Yeah. And that's, you know, that's that sense of, yeah, I don't have to worry about that. Right? Yeah. When, when was your first moment or episode when you thought that you could put food on a table after mm. school or um, while no, or during school? No, uh, even in high school, when I looked at my dad, you know, I, was, I had this confidence that, you know, um, I, I could take care of myself and him if I needed to and my wow. family. Yeah. 
uh, I think that's the confidence you get out of being a son of an entrepreneur. Yeah. So you you went to college in the U.S. Yes, I did. right. Got great degrees, masters and bachelors at great schools. Were you already entrepreneurial while schooling there? One of the reasons I went to the U.S. was to pursue my dream to become an entrepreneur. Okay. Right? Uh, my heroes were like Bill Gates and Steve Jobs. Yeah. And I, I knew you could do big things in the U.S. as a geek. Right? I wasn't one of these glib sales guy. You know, I, I was not very sociable. But what these guys gave me uh, was a sense that it doesn't matter. If you've got great ideas and you can bring them into reality, you can build value. And uh, that engineer inclination in me was was driving that. Right. Um, that that's the thing that I'm actually not sure where I got it from because mm. my my dad's not an engineer, right? But I've got this incredible desire to build things, right? Even from young. I well, tell. you knew how to make money. <laughs> right and you definitely know how to make money what well, wasn't my focus right mm. literally wasn't my focus my focus was to do cool stuff with, with with products and engineering and 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 then subsequently i realized how fun that was with teams and building teams of people um ne never focused quite on making money but i think the result of the passion for products and the passion for people is you make money were you like building stuff already in in the dorm room uh or software you know software. just playing around with ideas yeah okay. my first company out of uh school was uh, a startup so okay talk uh, about that the dating company oh the, the dating was a little bit after but okay. uh, i can talk about the dating company first um it was actually very interesting um I, this is where i started the the idea of looking for ridiculous states of the world <laughs> right? You look at the, the, the situation and you go, this is nuts. Why is the world like this? Right? It makes no sense whatsoever. If you find something like this, there's probably a big business to be had in there. And uh, we were looking at classified ads and how people find things, you know, and they'll do, you know, looking at classified ads on newspapers with their finger and the, it was all ink. You go, wait, there are these things called computers, right? And the internet was fairly new at that point. So, this what? was in the 90s or 80s? Yeah, 90s. 90s. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm not that old. <laughs> but uh, I'm not that young. Either. Okay. <laughs> but um, so we, we built uh, this company called Electric Classifieds, right? And uh, lo and behold, when you do research into classified ads, the biggest money-making section was the personals. So we, we uh, got Match.com as a domain and we started doing the dating business. And uh, who have thought that, you know, it'll affect the meeting habits of most human beings. <laughs> uh, this was the early version of whatever is so popular now. Tinder. Oh, a match is still popular. <laughs> uh, so, uh, a match owns, I, I don't know, like half the dating apps out there. Right? Oh, so, my gosh. Yeah. Um, so it's a huge company now. And you made that, you created We, we that. started ma Match uh, 20, sorry, 95, I think. You're, 95, you're still 96. involved or no, you, no, you no, got no. out? Yeah, we sold the company some time ago. Uh, I think Barry Diller, who bought uh, the company with IAC, really cranked it up to the scale it is today. And, and some of the guys at OkCupid, they were also responsible, whom a couple of them I'm in touch with, were also responsible for creating uh, the scale of that business. Yeah. How many companies have you gotten involved in before you came up with this VC idea? Oh, wow. Uh, I started basically three companies, founded or co-founded three right. companies, but involved with is a very broad, yeah. you know, I've brainstormed. Well, let's go broad, man. <laughs> <laughs> I've brainstormed lots of ideas with lots of entrepreneurs. So involved at the pre-seed level, you know, before they even started the company, mm. uh, invested, uh, before, uh, we started Monksil, I was already investing with other funds. So, you know, um, I'd say like literally dozens yeah. be before I even started investing from a fund, uh, as a, as a founder, you already start investing with seed capital, a bunch of other folks. 
but if I don't count that, uh, uh, I still had dealings with you know dozens of companies. What what led you up to leave the United States? To leave the United States, simple. My dad wasn't so well. I know? see. Yeah, so I came back. You yeah. know, best decision I ever made in my life. Yeah. I had uh, seven more years with him yeah. in Singapore. Same here, man. So you came back to Singapore. Yeah. And then you continued your endeavors. Yeah. And then you decided to go to China. Yes. Right? That uh, was after your dad passed? Or? After he passed, okay. I discovered I had all these family members in China, <laughs> right. not very distant, they're second cousins, right? my dad's cousins, kids, right? So I met a whole bunch of them. I met 41 male Pengs. <laughs> <laughs> Pengs my generation only. Uh, and, you know, it's amazing, right? So I, I spent a bunch of time getting to know them. And I realized there's this whole part of my life that I had no clue about. So I decided to move to China and I had a good friend called Richard Lim. And he invited me to, to join GSR and I did. And that was yet another adventure, right? Uh, investing in some of the biggest, I don't know what they call them. They're bigger than unicorns, right? They're worth like tens of billions. Oh, yeah. right? TT, for example, we invested in when it was uh, Series A. Right? Wow. Uh, Elimi, yeah. uh, that was, we got that in as a C company. And when there were four kids invest, uh, delivering product out of their dorm rooms, right? So, and we, that was sold for like $10 billion wow. uh, to Ali. So a whole bunch of other companies uh, I got involved in. Uh, great, great, great fun in China. The, the temptation to go to China yeah. over the US mm -hmm. at that time was more related to the roots. your having roots there. Yeah. I, I just but economically, it could have gone either way, right? Yeah. Right. No, uh, the U.S. is where if, if I wanted to make money, the yeah. U.S. is where I, I knew the system. I right. grew up there. Right. You know, I had the connections there. But China was this, this huge country where yeah. my dad's from yeah. that I have no clue what it was about. Right. And I failed my Chinese all through high school. <laughs> <laughs> so I didn't read Chinese literature or anything close. So I thought, hey, you know, better go figure out where, where that part of your life came from. Where about in China was your dad from? Um, Fujian. Okay. Yeah, he, he was actually born in Beijing, but uh, the family's from Fujian, yeah. from uh, a place called Zhangzhou, uh, which is very near Xiamen. Uh, and uh, um, yeah, and most of my, uh, um, the Ong families were mostly around there from still. Fujian, yeah. yeah, they didn't move too far. Talk, talk about the founding of Mong Sil. So, um, so I was in China mm. um, and I was chair of a fund called uh, Infocom Investments, mm. which is actually a $200 million government fund uh, that I helped the government uh, run. And I brought in Kuo Yi, whom I had known from uh, a previous startup. Uh, I brought him in to run uh, Infocom Investments, and both of us were talking and we realized um, this region, Southeast Asia, was due for um, a real boom in tech. And the Series A investors, beyond the seed, right, Series A investors were not, were just not there. Actually, it turns out a number of other funds, a bunch of other people figured this out also and decided to start the fund. So we decided also to start Mangsil around 2012, incorporated it in 2013. So this is our 10th year anniversary. Wow. And, nice. uh, and um, we started fundraising and you know, started uh, investing. Our first check went to Ninja Van in 2015 in January. Wow, hell of a time. Yeah, still, still a great, I, I actually think- That was, that was even, when not a lot of people were thinking of doing venture. Yes, yes. Right? I mean, you were, I think you were one of very, very few out there yeah. looking at well, Southeast Asia. The Singapore government actually did invest in a whole bunch of seed funds, mm. uh, 16 of them to be accurate. Uh, this is part of the National Research Foundation. Mm. I was on a board then when we did that. And that triggered a whole bunch of um, startups in yeah. the region. I think they weren't, they were very clear. It's not just Singapore. They had to go to the region. So they started doing that. 
And that formed the pool of the investable companies that we as Series A company uh, fund could invest in. So talk about your investment philosophy. Yeah. I mean, you've talked about first principles and all that. Right? Yeah. That, there's a few things we adhere to which make us very different. I mean, fr- first of all, we have four partners, two venture partners, a bunch of other associates, and uh, the, all the partners are former CEO founders. You know, mm. uh, almost everyone is a former founder or been in a startup, right, in, in the investment team. So we just have a different view of how you engage entrepreneurs. Um, and what we look for is also somewhat different. Uh, first principles, um, can, do you actually have a unique economic model that you can, you can scale up to make money, right? Um, we, we like to, to joke about this uh, concept of negative blitz scaling. When you actually have a negative unique economics and you scale your sales anyway, right? Resulting in a very uh, negative scaling of your profits, right? Your losses, basically. Um, and, and that was a trend last 10, 15 years we thought was a bit nuts. We focus on really solid unit economics. We focus on uh, what we call, and, and this is probably the main thing, philosopher warrior type of founders, right? founders that have a very, very clear on what they're trying to do. You ask them everything from why are you an entrepreneur and why are you building this company to how does this marketing campaign return at least three X? They're very, very clear on everything. Right? Mm. They've thought it through logically, um, systematically. You know, um, then you see their warrior side, right? They go, yeah. okay, bam, execute. And they get things done, right? Very quickly, things are done. You, you give them a suggestion, they agree it's a good idea. Next week, you talk to them, oh yeah, we've rolled it out through a thousand you know, customers already. You know, that, that's what we look for. And that's another piece I've added to this philosopher warrior now, and that's the nurturer. Right? As they scale up, they need to grow people. Um, so that's what we look for. That above everything else drives success. And we've learned through painful mistakes by mm. sort of going, oh, that's a great idea. Don't quite like this founder, but we'll try it anyway. It doesn't work that way. Talk, talk about the mistakes yeah. that you would have made that were really tough to undo yeah if if you invest in a founder who is has less than the level of integrity you need to be a you know successful business person um there's no way to recover from that right yeah. you've just lost the investment yeah. if you if you invest in someone that has um how do i say being right then it's more important than winning, meaning the ego is driving mm. things much more than building a successful team, etc. That's why you get in trouble, right? Because people don't tell you stuff if you don't want to hear stuff, right? Yeah. Um, so those types of investments are really hard to recover from. Right? We, we, we focus, uh, generally we focus on getting that right up front. And early on, we, we made a few mistakes, you know. Um, and what I like to say is, the older I get, the less I trust myself in positive decisions about people, right? So we start building systems around that. The, the, the competent bad people are really difficult to tell <laughs> apart from the competent good people. <laughs> Yeah. So, so we, we build, you know, do the um, reference check systems, you know, uh, background checks, etc. to, to do that. Um, Dude, I mean, everybody has cognitive bias. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Especially if you think that's a great guy, you, you forget, you know, to do the right things. Right. Um, yeah. So, so now we, we, we tend to be a little bit more systematic about yeah. the founders, you know, we get a few of us talk to the same person, same founder. Uh, we spend a bit more time with them before we write the, the checks. You know, since I first met you, yeah, you wrote me in as, you know, a member of the council, the Angsana Council, right? You've, you've always been talking about paying particular attention to unit economics when you're looking at something, right? Yeah. 
it's a little bit different from the conversations that are ongoing out there with respect to some well, of the it's other coming guys. back now <laughs> well i'm yeah. talking about maybe until about Last a year and a half ago yeah right how did you feel i mean you you must have felt differently little, right yeah because you know if, if you're a surfer you know yeah. you're waiting for this wave right it may take you three hours yeah. <laughs> you hear conversations about these guys that are not waiting for yeah. as long as you are yeah uh, that, that's got to be disturbing it, it, it yeah. is um I, i think the fact that i've done three other companies before that yeah. gives me a certain level of confidence yeah and mm. and trusting my philosopher yeah it, right um what what i couldn't have predicted is that this bubble of this this negative blitz scaling way of thinking mm. just uh momentum trading in in you know entrepreneurship right right uh i couldn't have figured out this would last like 10 12 years that that's something i didn't expect right um, interesting uh what i knew it, it would stop at some point yeah because we've seen enough of these cycles you know gravity works at some point right no matter how high you go. unless you hit escape velocity which then the analogy breaks but um uh, what what was hard to predict and what was hard to maybe explain to people is look this is going to stop at some point right if you go down the path uh you might get lucky and get out in time but you can see most vcs that went in that direction they didn't get out in time right uh, if you momentum trade a very important strategy is when you get out but i think people weren't thinking of themselves as momentum trading when they were doing these yeah. um, high valuations at negative uh, unit economics there's this perennial trust and dependence on the high velocity of money yeah right yeah. and yeah. boy how they missed out yeah right well, Yeah, I mean, there there are a few people I I know that actually were very clear that this was momentum trading, and they got in, they got out, and they made their money. You yeah. know, it's like crypto, yeah. right? I mean, if you go long for crypto, I think you'll be in not so good shape right now. Yeah, right. But um, but there were a whole bunch of people that were traders. Yeah, and they made money. Yeah, um, I've never been a trader, you know, momentum trading kind of guy. I'm a fundamentals kind of person, so yeah. um, so that's not my game. I don't play that game. Does does your philosophy or philosophizing trickle to each one of the founders that you've invested in? Or? I hope so. I, I talk about <laughs> <laughs> no, no. I because it's it's the success of the business, right? Right. If they don't think deeply about their business, yeah. uh, you know, they they will be challenged. It's down to their relationship with their leadership team, the responsibility of a CEO, you know, how to, even if you have a great team, always be looking at upgrading folks, you know, is, is, is triple clicking into your, the details of your business, mm. is questioning how technology like AI, for example, is going to disrupt uh, uh, your business models, mm. you know. So you always got to be thinking, yeah. right? And one of the toughest things I try to get, especially the type A, the really go-getters to do is actually take half a day off on the weekend and think, right? That that turns out to be the hard thing to do yeah. because they're so used to pushing mm. forward aggressively. Yeah. And I've seen the, the disadvantage of even very smart people who don't stop to think, right? Yeah. They, they do something very well, but that they maybe shouldn't be doing, yeah. right? And they missed out on huge opportunities. They get they get caught in this loop. Yeah, which the, I'm doing. Therefore, I must be creating value. Yeah, kind of view and, of and lots of times it just entails arrogance and or unconsciousness. Blind, 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 huh? Or unconsciousness. Or unconsciousness. Yeah. Right. Which is which is scary. I mean, yeah. not not that I haven't gone through any of these. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I'll show you the bruises. Yeah, but. When when do you think this bloodbath is going to end? I, I don't think the lessons have been learned yet because we've got a whole generation of founders and VCs right. that grew up in this and they think this is what tech is about. Right? I have the advantage of being a bit older and being tech like 30 years 
already. So, you know, I, I know this this was a bubble. This is just a huge, long bubble, um, but it's over, right? And we are back to how gravity works, how yeah. unit economics work. Um, and, and people are just starting to figure it out, I think. Uh, a lot of the founders are a bit lost, you know. Um, I, I know one guy that's, he calls himself a failed founder. He did a company, ran out of money. Right. He's trying to form, form almost like a, a alcoholic anonymous <laughs> for failed founders. <laughs> So they, as they, a startup, they, yeah, no, 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 no. It's just a group. They're just trying to like help each other, you know, okay. think through things, and to figure out what's next for them in life. You know, I hope a whole bunch of these guys will take their their learnings and go back and build great companies from here. Yeah, it's just that the when the whole world is telling you to run in a particular direction, it's yeah. hard to go. You know, I'm going to think through what I need to do and just go do it. Right? I, I think it cuts both ways. You know, the capital allocators had yeah. tremendous amount of capital. Yes. Yeah. And then the people that were knocking on their doors were promising yeah. large pools of revenue generation, yeah. <laughs> yeah, which so would that, entail large pools of profitabilities, yeah. right? Oh, uh, yeah. But none of these two are, none of whatever. Yeah. So, so this, this um, uh, it used to be a, a pretty downward spiraling, um, ecosystem in that we were doing things that were not going to create high value companies. Right. Um, and I saw that actually start in China, not here. Right. And, uh, I think China got lucky because, um, the Chinese companies got lucky because it was very early on in the cycle. So you could actually exit some of that wealth and it went over to the, um, uh, public site. Right. Um, and also some of these companies had enough time to figure out, okay, I actually need to make money to figure that. They had enough capital to, to get to some kind of break even points. Uh, not a lot of us out here have had that opportunity. I wanna, I wanna shift gear to Southeast Asia mm. broadly and compare that with China, right? Mm. I mean, at, at the Angsana Council, we were, talking about how we underperformed yeah. Southeast Asia, right? With respect yeah. to China. Yeah. You've been to both places. Yeah. And how the GDP per capita in Southeast Asia has only gone up 2.7 times, China yeah. 10 times, and because of the obvious attributes, yeah. governance, lack of competition, underinvestment in education, underinvestment in infrastructure. Yeah. How do you see it forward? Um, I think the the one of the reasons we go slower is because um i think the 98 um crisis yeah. um cost all our institutions suck the oxygen yeah, out, yeah to to be a lot more conservative mm. and you could say there's advantages to that you know we don't crash as easily right uh, global financial uh, global downturn and we seem to be moving on okay you know, some inflation um so, so I think that's one of the reasons, um, but you know, the, I, th I think one of the underpinnings that uh, I really hope we, we figure out, um, in Southeast Asia is education, you know, in, in China, education is, you know, available to everyone to quite a high level and, and you're, you're both socially and institutionally, they have this drive to get kids educated, right? Um, and, uh, in fact, uh, all my foundations that I'm involved with, are around education, right? Um, just to give you a sense, right. Um, how important this is, this is very personal. Mm. The 41 male pinks that I met, I mentioned earlier, they were all, um, um, pig farmers, um, uh, grocery shop owners, you know, not well off people, right? And, um, but then I had other cousins and relatives from the female side of the family, my, uh, grandpa's sisters, right. families, my dad's female cousins, families, the Chans, the, the Zhangs, the Liaos, etc. And they were doing okay. Hmm. They were like doctors, you know, um, PhDs, real estate developers, uh, factory owners, you know, business owners. 
So I, when I first met all these people, I went, what is going on with this family, right? <laughs> the Ongs were like poor and the others were doing fine, right? Um, and I kept asking and then I finally realized um, when, when the communists took over, um, uh, they didn't like my family much, the Ongs, right? Because my great grandfather was a landlord. See. So they restricted the education of the kids. So interesting. So most of the Ongs in my family didn't go beyond elementary school. Ouch. Yeah. Mm. And that's that's the only difference. That's There's hundreds of people. Existential. Yeah. And and you can see this difference yeah. just because one group didn't get the education, mm. the other group did. And that's that's all. So so this is why I'm so passionate about education. Mm. And I think that's where um, Southeast Asia needs to really push really hard. And, and I have to admit, it, it goes down to even nutrition, right? At, right. at, at the lower level, stunting is a mm. big issue in Southeast Asia. Yeah. So, so that's that. Just making sure our human brains develop. I mean, one of the things I I saw up front and personal was when I first started Mangsil, we went to Myanmar. And then we went to different parts like Vietnam and Philippines and so on. You can actually see Myanmar was the first place I saw the effects on GDP per capita on the shapes of heads, right? If you wow. you, you could see that there's something wrong with some of the As folks. As in there. bigger or smaller? They're, they're misshapen, okay. right? Because they didn't have enough nutrition when they were growing yeah. up, right? You could actually see that when you start to hit the Philippines and Indonesia and, and Malaysia, Thailand, it, it's harder to see that, right? But you could see that if you push, push the GDP low enough. So, so that's the first thing, making sure mm. kids can develop properly. And then it's education. Um, uh, I, I think this is how, uh, if, you, if you think about my, my own country, Singapore, all the things they've done right, I, I would say education is one of the key things, right? I'm a huge beneficiary of yeah. that, right? Well, Just, Singapore is, in yeah. general, it's a big beneficiary of how much it's invested yeah. in education. Yeah, yeah. And I, I don't know how to say more about that. You mm -hmm. know, the, the difference between China and Southeast Asia, one of the biggest ones is that. There's another difference I think works that works in our favor. Um, China is a large market and it's yeah. great for founders to start and go grow and all that. The problem for the Chinese companies though, they are monoculture, mono, monolingual, right. you know, etc. And it's very, very hard for them to go international. The rest of the world is much bigger than China, right? The rest of the world is much bigger than the US. Our companies have to go international. Yeah early on because each one of our countries is too small for yeah. a large you know, tech company to be built. So, you know, most companies have, you know, uh, Goto, for example, is multiple countries, Tokopedia is multiple countries. Uh, in fact, you, you can't build, you cannot build a big company in Southeast Asia and be in one country only, yeah. right? So, well, the rest of the world is ours to go after, right? We've got the culture, we've got the systems, we've got the abstraction that allows you to keep going to the next country and the next and the next. And we will do that, you know. Uh, at one point, Forrest Lee from C Group was telling me uh, his second largest market, Brazil. Yeah. Right. So it's it's um, it's happening. Yeah, and it's amazing. They're trailblazers. Yeah. So that's our advantage, right? Yeah. There's disadvantage. Education could be better. But I think our advantage is we're set up to conquer the world. Yeah. But let's, uh, I want to peel the onion a little bit here. I've, I've talked about PISA a few times, right? Yeah. With you and separately. Yeah. That, that is so telling. Yes. You know, just for Southeast Asia, of, of all the 10 countries, only two stand out above the global average. Yeah. Singapore and Vietnam. Yeah. Singapore is globally number two now after China. Vietnam, I think, is thinking of catching up with China, not just Singapore. Yeah. The rest are below average. Yeah. You know, Indonesia, Philippines, Malaysia, surprisingly, yeah. Malaysia. Who would have thought Malaysia yeah. would be below the global average? So it, it depicts the degree to which you're lingually proficient or lack 
thereof. And stem wise, yeah. you know, and that is quite structural. Yeah, it is. What, what do you think are some of the things we could do? I mean, I, I have the simple idea, right? What if we get 400 million people in Southeast Asia to be able to speak English? <laughs> with yeah, the yeah. help of AI, with the yes. help of Mongsil and whatever, right? You, Let's you, gang bust on this. You, you, you're actually um, talking about, you know, one of the foundations that you and I are involved yeah. in, Solve Education, yeah. right? Uh, is trying to teach kids English with an AI, right? Yeah. With a game and an AI. So we're trying. Um, it's not so straightforward, right? But um, what you realize is that if you want to teach kids in Asia English um, and you try to do it the traditional way, you know, build schools, train teachers and all that, it'll be probably one or two generations before we get there, right? Because there are not enough teachers yeah. that are competent in English to teach the kids. So then you ask yourself, is it possible to just transmit that information into the heads of kids, mm. the in skills of English, right? Into the heads of kids. And you realize it's doable and it's getting more doable now with technology, right? So that's what that Solve Education project is about. It, it's, it's to explore how technology can basically teach kids English for now, and then math and then life skills and other things later on. Um, I think we're, we're hitting, uh, we've hit more than 10, uh, a million kids, but right now we're, we're trying to focus on the, the, um, what do we call monthly, uh, uh, learners, right? M monthly active learners. How many kids are actually learning, you know, system every, every month. And the number we are at is something like 20, 30,000. We're trying to hit 50,000 by the end of the year. Right. So that's like a huge school, yeah. right? But we want to be in the millions. Yeah. Right? Um, and then maybe get to that 400 million in a few years. I'm thinking of 100 million Indonesians speak English. Yeah. The remaining 300, the rest of Southeast Southern. Asia. Yeah. We'd be killing it. Yeah. Man. I, I'm, I'm amazed sometimes when you, I meet um, the Indonesian, some of the Indonesian kids here, they, they speak to me in like perfect American English, right? Yeah. And I, Talk to their parents who who struggle a little bit with English, right? And I'm going, how how did the kid learn? Yeah, YouTube. Yeah. They <laughs> and probably watch my channel. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> well, seven hundred thousand people. <laughs> no, but but that's in cities, right? In yeah. urban sites. But if yeah. you go suburban, yeah. you, you drive forty five miles it's, out, and it's totally yeah. different picture, man. Yeah. I mean, I I go out and meet up with these people. Yeah. And and you know, I get misconstrued for i don't know you know english is so damn important because it's most of the knowledge in the world Franca, is documented right? in english yes most economic activities are done in english you, you cannot be a software engineer and not know english <laughs> <There you go. laughs> everything let is the, in let english. the software engineer speak <laughs> <laughs> and you cannot be a doctor if you don't know english yeah. right so everything is documented in english it's a default language. I have friends in the UN that tell me, the, the older ones, it used to be like French, now it's English, right? You, you, and everyone at that level know English, right? It's sort of the default language of the world now. How, however, however it got there doesn't matter. It's the default language. So if you want information, it's easiest to get that in English. Um, the AIs aren't good enough to translate everything to your local language yet. Right. Yeah. And so, so if you want to access it, don't fight it. Just learn it and go. Right. Indonesia probably has less than ten percent of its population being able to be proficient mm. in international languages, yeah. inclusive of English. Yeah. We got to bump that percentage up. Yeah. You know, to forty, fifty percent. Totally agree. Th it's an economic issue now. Yeah. Right. I mean, yeah. even the average Indonesia who who can transact in English uh, makes more money salary wise yeah. you know, than, yeah. than if they don't. Right. Yeah. So, and this is true, not here, just here. It's all over the Southeast Asia. That's on the lingual stuff. Yeah. What about on the STEM side? Yeah. What do you think could be done to, to upgrade our STEM capabilities? I'll, I'll share with you some statistics. I, I was talking to a computer science professor at the University of Chicago from Indonesia. 
Mm. He was sharing me the number of STEM graduates with PhD. I forget the year, 2018 or 2021. The international graduates, China, yeah. over 6,000. Yeah. From India, over 2,000. Korea, 1,000 something. Turkey, 400 something. Indonesia, only 82. Singapore is, I think, above Indonesia. Ghana is above Indonesia. <laughs> you know, it's like, man, if we were to, you know, yeah, move the needle up a little bit on STEM, I think that number ought to change. And and there's yeah. this myth about not having enough funding for PhD yeah. programs. And and this guy was telling me, you know, it's the wrong myth. Yeah, because it's not a question of funding; it's more of a question of competence. If if you get in, the school will fund you. And, yeah. and empirically, 80% of the funding for PhD programs in STEM are funded by the very institutions. Yeah. And a lot you of know. disciplines in computer science don't require a lot of money. Yeah. Right? It's just a lot of thinking. Yeah. Um, I, I agree. Um, I think um, this is, there's a lot going on in, in computer science now with AI yeah. and all that. And this is the time we are about to disrupt the world again with software. Yeah. And this is a time for countries to think very strategically about what they can do. Right? There's still time. Right? If you get into it now, in 10 years time, it could be a huge difference in your economy. Right? I'm actually having a dialogue with some of the Philippine uh, folks who are part of their presidential council to try and figure out the strategy um, for the Philippines right. to take a significant stake in the future of software and mm. AI, right? in, in not just the region, but in Asia and in the world. So the things are changing very fast. And when that happens, you have the opportunity to come and do something about it. So all, all you need is the willpower. And frankly, this is a very small part of um, uh, the economy very very tiny you you just need you, we've got 250 million people 270 million people in this country you just take the top you know point yeah. one percent and yeah. every one of them could be world world-class computer scientists yeah. right it's just that they're not encouraged to do yeah. that right? and um you you could uh tilt the lpdp program to encourage computer science people right and that itself could there's enough funding there to, right. to just that alone to, to create hundreds of PhDs in computer science. Right? I think for a country with 280 million people, it's apt that we start thinking of scale, right? And there's sparks of excellence, yeah. right? Sporadically. Yeah. But we need to think big. And, and even collectively for Southeast Asia, we need to think even bigger yeah. in, in the context of having to compete with the Indias of the world, the Chinas of the world, yeah. and the big guns of the world, right? And I want to talk about teachers, mm. right? Because f it's quite fundamental, right? You can come up with the coolest curricula, but if you end up with <laughs> the wrong <laughs> teachers, yes. yeah. I mean, our kids are not going to get educated yeah. as well as we want them to be, yeah. right? And that, that I think, is, is, is a good investment. Yeah. You know, it's Singapore excellent. has... I think aced this. They've invested in recruiting the best people out of academic institutions yeah. to become teachers. Yeah, and not they're the well paid. paid people. Yeah, and yeah. South Korea does the same thing. Yeah, Israel too. Yeah, but I think the other nine countries in Southeast Asia need to emulate. You know, for STEM and lingual proficiency purposes. Yeah, one thing I, I learned from my experience in South Education, and this is not a very positive thing to mm. say, but it is true. A lot of people in education in emerging markets are not in education because they care about kids, right? But a lot of them are, but a lot of them, enough of them are not. They're there to make a living, right? And the result is so long as they can get their paycheck, they'll do the minimum things they need to do to get the paycheck. I think that's, we've taken the nobility out of being a teacher, yeah. right? Um, and I think that's 
it's probably at least half a generation to fix that problem. Right. And that's why I've gone down the path of technology. Mm. Um, because I think the fact that about a third of kids on the planet today will be illiterate is another ridiculous state of the world, right? This yeah. is just crazy nuts. And, and how do you fix that quickly? Um, I think getting teacher to be a more noble um, profession will take time. Yeah. Right. So, and, and that's why I'm focused on the technology. Not, not to say we shouldn't do it, right? Yeah. But it's going to take a generation, I think, um, if, if we start today, which we're not starting. Right? So I, I'm, I'm actually, one of the things I'm hoping my, my team would, would do is to try and figure out uh, an LLM that will act like a teacher that will fit in the phone. Mm. Right. Interesting. Um, so you can actually have a teacher in a phone and, and do one-on-one -on -one, you know, lessons with kids. That's one, one of the toughest problems when you don't have a teacher. The teacher gives you moral support, yeah. encouragement. You know? um, and um, a game doesn't do that. Yeah. You know, AI doesn't do it well. Right. So if you can actually build um, an AI that acts more like a teacher, I think that, that could help. That's probably. I'm trying true. to find the odds. I'm trying to become a teacher. <laughs> I'm trying to spend more time <laughs> well, in then, classrooms. Yeah, then you right? you, you got to figure out how to amplify. I think you got well, to figure out. This is one avenue, yeah. right? Of of amplifying yeah. whatever people think is cool or whatever people think is not cool. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And I'm I'm so fixated with this idea that if you pick a really good teacher. Mm -hmm. He or she can teach yes. about a year and a half's worth of teaching in a year. But if you really pick a sucky teacher, you, you, you lose your you interest. You end up <laughs> with somebody who teaches you about a half year's worth of teaching in a year. Yeah. And I just. If, if you stay a, interested in that subject, you might just go, oh my go gosh. do something else. And, and this is occurring in many parts of the world, yeah. right? Not just Indonesia. Yeah. And, and how do we deal with this? And, and to put this in the context of how the global order has shifted right, yeah. into a much more multipolar yeah. kind of world, you're stuck, man, in a room with just one guy. You got to negotiate the hell out of yeah. whatever. Yeah. And if you're not competitive, if you're not productive, you're toast. Yeah. Yeah. Whereas multilateralism is a beauty, right? You can piggyback on yeah, some big just, boy hey, let me follow to you. pull you the guy that you need to negotiate yeah, with. Yeah, like we have the principle of single undertaking, yeah. and you're 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 in good hands. Yeah, but if you need to keep on bilateralizing, you need to shape up, man. You need to yep. become more productive, and that yeah. can only happen by way of becoming more lingually proficient and scientifically proficient. Yeah, and professionally mm. competent. Uh, I, I. I I think the we talked a little bit about this earlier. Um, I think the fact that the world is getting more and more efficient mm. leaves you less and less places to hide. Yeah. Right. Uh, and if you are uh, the prisoner's dilemma, right? Yeah. Uh, if you are in a transparent, efficient society, you, you got to be nice. You got to be capable. Otherwise, you won't flourish. Right. And I think that's where the world is moving towards with uh, computers making things more transparent. Um, I think with AI, hopefully making things more transparent in the future. I think the journey there is, is going to be a little bit of a challenge, but um, uh, the, the, I, I guess I, I, being a computer scientist, I maybe overthink about how computers can make a difference, right? <laughs> You've got to believe in your profession, I guess. Um, and for me is when I, when I look at human systems and I look at the possibility of digital systems, at this point, I think it might be more predictable to push the digital systems as opposed to the human systems um, and more scalable. I think that's the other reason. I've, I've been holding off so hard on AI because <laughs> I want to save that for the yeah. the last part of the conversation, right? Because that's that's going to occupy a lot of minutes. But yeah. last bit on ASEAN, on mm. Southeast Asia, right? I mean, 
I've I've been known for you know promoting Singapore. It's a good example of the really cool intersection of power and talent, right? And how they select talent a lot more based on meritocracy as opposed to loyalty and or patronage. Yeah. What can the other countries in Southeast Asia learn? I mean, obviously, you just got to recognize that it's a good thing. <laughs> yeah. Right? But what, what, what can we do to just speed it up a bit? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's in everybody's interest. Yeah. Right? It's yeah. probably more in the interest of the other nine. Yeah. But I think Singapore would look even more cool yeah. if everybody else emulates it. The, the good things, not the bad things. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think you know more about the answer to that question than I do because you've been a politician. You, you, you understand. <laughs> that, was a, that was a lifetime ago. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what, what uh, I scratch my head over a lot of times is how um, the bureaucracy doesn't lead to optimizing for the masses, right? When, when, when democracy is at work, when people compete in the political arena, the result doesn't necessarily improve the lives of the average you know, citizen. I, 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 I struggle to understand why that, that is, right? Uh, but, uh, and I'm also cautious to realize that there's a lot of luck in how Singapore got to be the way it is, right? The luck of having Lee Kuan Yew and the PAP there in the 60s, right? If we didn't have that, we won't have Singapore. Yeah. And a bunch of Cambridge and really smart people, graduates and really smart you know, people. I call that serendipity. Yeah. And, and it, Singapore, it could have turned out differently. Yes. And we might not have been kicked out of mm. Malaysia, and, mm. you know. Um, and, and the fact that they happen to be some of the more honest people around, right? Refuse corruption. And Singapore happened to be small enough that you run it like a company. Serendipitous. Yes. So, so if you scale that up, I don't know how possible it is to, um, to sort of emulate Singapore in that sense, right? It's just a lot of us, we, we have to admit as Singaporeans, we have to admit that there's a lot of luck that got us where it is. A lot of good decisions, hard work as a result of the luck. But you know, without that luck, we would not be there. Um, so, but having said that, I'm also a firm believer that great leaders can make huge differences. Yeah. You know, the, the one scholarship that Monks Hill uh, funds and I, I work with is called TASLA. It's a technology and science leadership academy. Mm. We're trying to get Indonesian kids, the top Indonesian kids, to think beyond being an engineer yeah. to being a leader. Yeah. And that's what the scholarship is about. Um, I'm a strong believer, if anything, one or two people at the right places in history can change the course of history. Yeah. And but how you find those people and how they get up to the top to yeah. be able to do that is hard. And, and, and to be able to s remain consistent yeah, for long and enough. And off yeah. all the, oh, the bad sins, yeah. the temptations, whatever. Yeah. It's not easy, man. Yes. It's a, it's a true sign of, I think, great leadership. Yeah. And I, I think how... Um, each one of the countries in ASEAN gets there. Um, I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful that however messy it is, democracies work the system until you get some capability. But uh, so, sometimes it's hard, right? You look at Europe and you look at the US, you go, is this where democracy is going to lead us, right? Mm. <laughs> Not sure. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've been arguing that Singapore ought to be considered a pretty good liberal democracy. Yes. Yeah. yeah you no, know, I agree. You know, maybe ten to twenty years ago, you could criticize it for being some some sort of a benign dictatorship, but yeah. I think it's learned. 
to give space and room to the opposition. Yeah. It's learned to give space and room to the media yeah. for being critical yeah. of things. Yeah. But it's it's been proving itself to be good in distributing power to the hands of many, but also a bunch of public goods to the hands of many, healthcare, welfare, yeah. intellect, social value, moral value, and all that good stuff. You know, people get bogged down with the definition of a democracy or a liberal democracy yeah. by way of saying, well, we're distributing power to the hands of many, but we're not distributing out of public goods to the many. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. You can't call yourself a great liberal democracy. Yes. Yeah. And yeah. I think that's that's the fundamental problem, right? The the Western view of what democracy is. Right. Doesn't seem to be working all that well. Yeah. Right. And we're scratching our heads going, okay, if that doesn't work that well, what 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 are we supposed to do, right? Yeah. Um, and I, I don't think there's any substitute for having great leaders come up. This is why the scholarship, right? Um, I, I'm, I see that in companies all the time. Mm. Every single company that does well, we look in there, why is it doing a great leader, right? Doesn't do well, not so good leader. Yeah. It's very simple, right? So no different from an organization, a country, I don't think it, it's any different. So the, the trick for every country, I think, is to figure out how to get your greatest people to lead. Right? Yeah. Um, and and you, you realize if you're not careful, you can degenerate, you know, so that the greatest, your best people don't want to lead because it's too much of a sacrifice or it's, yeah. you know, and, and that's what I worry about for Southeast Asia. I, I see people pushing, trying to, you know, get the the better folks up front, mm. and I think that's I'm hopeful, but I'm still quite puzzled as to how you can systematically get there. Right? Um, we we formed uh, to to just go back to our Ansana Council. I yeah. mean, we we formed the Ansana Council, as you know, to to try and tell the rest of the world, Southeast Asia, yeah. it, it's a great place. Um, to invest in, but I think that the side effect of this will also be to motivate Southeast Asian about where we can go, the potential. Yeah. And we're seeing this in conversations in like the Philippines and here, yeah. uh, where people are excited about the possibilities if we get our our visions aligned, where, where this place can go. This is already one of the growth centers in the world. Mm. What if we doubled on that, right? Mm. Or tripled on that, right? And you can look at this place like Europe, you know, uh, 10 years, 20 years from now. Yeah. I think that's a possibility. Yeah. And that's why I'm very, very pro Southeast Asia yeah. from that point of view. I'm, I'm very bullish. Uh, we just need more storytellers. Yeah. And, and the Angsana Council, I think, is built upon the premise or idea that we need to tell the stories. Yes. Right. Absolutely. I mean, it, it, it hurts me when I go to places around the world where, where people just want to talk about India more. Yeah. Want to talk about China more. They want to talk about Taiwan more. Yeah. And just by sheer size of the economy and the population, I think we're, yeah. we're a pretty cool dude, you know? Yeah. We're, we're larger than India, GDP yeah. wise, right? Yeah. GDP per capita. 3.5 to double. 4 trillion now. Yeah. Dollars. Yeah. And I want to, Try to shift gear here a bit, but I think, you know, there's this notion. It's a bit paradoxical. Mm -hmm. There's this notion as, that the transition into or towards computer hegemony is going to be so darn smooth, <laughs> right? <laughs> because they're so darn intelligent, right? But Intelligence is the very thing that's going to disrupt the smoothness, yeah. right? And, and I want to push this into the next, you know, discussion on, on, on AI. Yeah. Is, is that the right way to think of the paradox? Yeah, well, yes. I mean, we, we talked earlier about my distrust of my ability to judge positively, right? right. It's the competent bad people, right? <laughs> so AI is not just going to be wielded by competent yeah. good people, right? And sometimes not even competent people, 
right? Uh, and I worry about that because AI is going to get better and better about getting to its objective. So if your objective is good, well, great, right? But you know there are competent bad people out there. They could they could uh, potentially use it um, for not so good purposes, like misinformation, right? It's great at generating all kinds of crazy stuff, right? Clickbaits. Yeah. <laughs> and you can totally, you know, w w disrupt uh, an election by just flooding, you know, the, the environment with bad information. Um, so much so that you, you can't tell. I mean, um, so I, I do worry about competent bad people, but I actually also worry about my own tribe, right? The, the engineers, you know, I, I've seen a lot of the writings, the thinking behind AI, and I don't think there's enough um, computer science put into AI, not enough engineering put into AI in thinking about how these systems um, can go wrong and the, the engineering that's needed to make sure they don't, right? Um, so the, the analogy I keep talking about, this is the, the AI scientists came up with this thing and it looks like, wow, the dog is talking, right? And I can talk to the dog and wow, you know? But the next thing you do is not put the, the dog in front of a truck and say, drive, right? <laughs> or, or in front of a trading desk and say, you know, trade. trade, right? <laughs> you, you have no idea what the dog is thinking, right? And what kind of logic is, is behind all that talking. So I, I think from a, even from a computer science point of view, you need to think through the fact that these uh, neural networks are not tractable. I'll use the term tractable, which means you can predict what it's going to do, right? You, they are not tractable algorithms meaning you should never plug these things directly into something that's really mission critical. And if it did something wrong, you know, disasters will happen. People get killed or lots of money gets lost or something, right? You, you, you basically need some kind of straight jacketing and that straight jacketing would be something that uh, prevents the, the AI from doing crazy things, right? Uh, and, and that straight jacketing has to be software that is tractable. You can predict what that software is going to do, right? Um, and we know how to build software like that. But the people doing AI seem to be, at least by and large, clueless about this whole discipline in computer science and software engineering. Um, and I, I do worry about us accidentally doing bad things with AI also. Not not just the 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 competent bad people using mm -hmm. AI to do bad things, but also accidentally, yeah. you know, like we, we've been seeing a lot of biases in AI, right? Yeah. And, and people trying to control AIs in certain ways that have unforeseen uh, results in how it behaves. Um, and we can go into story after story about how data biases AI. And right. since we are in a biased society, the data is biased, so the AI will be biased. So we, we got to be really careful about doing how we get to sort of competent AI good. systems. Yeah. Competent and good. Yeah. I mean, and we kind of talked about this earlier, right? The, the analogy that I was trying to draw on is you know, people design cars mm. not to kill people. Yeah. But I think everybody needs to be sensitive to the side effect. Yeah. Of cars being deadly yeah it's one of the right? biggest killers of so you got men i'm giving ai the benefit of the doubt the creators of ai are probably have good intentions but once created and then once it's consumed there's lots of side effects here yeah it yeah. could be very deadly yeah i, I think cars still kill people right? yeah at, at some point maybe it'll be very very safe right yeah. with 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 uh self-driving cars and all right. that, you know, I expect the number of accidents to drop as the cars get more mm. digitized. Um, I think we're going to go through that same learning curve. 
I think AIs hopefully will be less deadly than cars. Yeah. Yeah. Um, because uh, they are less mission critical um, uh, technology. Do uh, Do you sense within the the universe of technologist there is ample ability to question, or there's just too much desire to cultivate? There's something that's happening in science the last five, 10 years that I really worry about, where politics has gotten into science, mm. right? Um, where you see well-known academics that have to resign because they've been diddling around with results, <laughs> right? So, and, and the peer review process appears to be quite broken, right? So there's tendencies for researchers, scientists, to basically chase just raw you know, academic results as opposed to thoughtful systems construction, right? Mm. To think through um, how things will affect society, right? So we're just chasing the, the technology itself, getting the doc to talk, so to speak, right? Um, and, and I worry about the transparency and honesty mm. of academia, uh, let alone sort of research groups in other places, right? Um, I, I don't really have an answer to that because once you start getting corrupt in the peer review system, yeah. it keeps cascading, right? The yeah. next generation doesn't have a good reference point now. And that, someone needs to worry seriously about that because that's not just AI, it's health, it's, it's public uh, health, it's, it's medicine, it's things that affect us in, in, in big ways. Right? I mean, I'm, I'm spending quite a bit of time in Silicon Valley now, right? In, in the small universe of technologists that I've been exposed to. Yeah. I sense that they act like they know what they're doing. Yeah. And, and that's okay. If it comes to science only. Yeah. But this is something that's going to affect humanity. Right. Yeah. And, and I think there's a, there's a fundamental need to at least get a discourse going yes. on a multidisciplinary manner. Yes. I agree. Right. And I don't think the culturalist, the economist, the environmentalist, the spiritualist, the philosophers, the historians are getting involved yeah. in, in a conversation, much less a discourse. That worries me, man. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I think the, the challenge is AI is quite a technical issue. Right? Mm. And so if you don't understand how it's functioning, even today, right? Forget uh, the emergent behaviors that no one really understands yet. The computer scientists definitely don't understand the emergent behavior. Why is it suddenly talking, right? Um, um, they can tell you what the numbers look like and et cetera, and it's talking, but why is it at this point it's talking? We don't know, right? Um, but if you're not well-versed in all that in the technology, this is not like it's not like the hydrogen bomb where the the function is quite easy to explain right uh, or, or the new uh, atomic bomb yeah. you know, it blows up and you destroy a lot of stuff so you can conceptualize that and have a, a ethical discussion on that a social political discussion on atomic energy atomic bombs etc this this is this pervades fundamentally into who we are and in terms of thinking thoughts, yes. right? And so it's not so easy, you know, to, I, I think the challenge is not so easy for people to have a technology-based discussion on a lot of these issues. Yeah. I think we should try, yeah. um, but I think that's where the challenge is, yeah. right? I, I think people will almost demand those conversations, right? Yeah. You were talking about cars having to make the decision between hitting the 
kid or the older guy, mm -hmm. right? Uh, if we're going to do that, we better have a social discussion, right? Not there's, just there's have morality some, here. Yeah, have involved. some engineer decide on the morality yeah. of the system, right? Uh, and that's the hard part uh, for for um, the AI scientists and engineers to realize where they've crossed the line into more of a social decision mm -hmm. versus you know a technical decision. It's it's not always black and white. I mean, no that. no doubt. If if you're good in AI, you're no dummy. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yes. You're so damn smart. Yeah. But but there's there's this concern intuitively in me at least. If if you get to be so capable in the field of science, right? And I've seen a lot of capable people around me. They 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 tend to think that they can always inoculate themselves. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know? well, it's arrogance, hubris, whatever you yeah, call it. Of, yeah, of any potential perils. Yeah. Right? It's like, dude, you don't know what you're talking about. I yeah. know what I'm doing. Yeah. So you know? whenever someone then, says that, then you get really <laughs> suspicious. It's like, you know, yeah. the, the alarm bells. Yeah. Right? Yeah. That should be. Yeah. So I'm, I'm trying to think, you know, to what extent would or should the regulatory bodies think about this, right? But, you know, I've, I've been kind of counterintuitive lately when I tell people that are trying to be entrepreneurs or whatever. I think, I think you got to have this mentality or mindset that you got to thrive despite the government. Yeah. Not because. Yeah. Right? That's your baseline. Yeah, that, that's what all entrepreneurs do. They, yeah. they build value in spite of everything else. Yeah. So I've, I've seen how, you know, OpenAI has decided to change from <clears throat> open source to closed source to nonprofit for, to for profit. That's just cultivation mode. Yeah. It's not questioning mode. Yeah. Right. And when you get into this cultivation mode, you dig. Yeah. But you lose skepticism. Yeah. You lose critical thinking capabilities. Yeah. That is a worry, I think. Yeah. I'm not trying to paint a very dystopian picture here i'm i'm, I'm open so, to the idea of I'll give utopianizing you a, it i'll give you a hopeful view of yeah uh, this whole AI, uh, llm's generative ai world most of it is open source yeah right so it's good yeah no one has a monopoly over all this stuff right. it, you you need right now because we're throwing the whole kitchen sink into the ai you need like fifty million dollars per LLM, you know. Um, uh, I I think uh, over time, I think some of the more interesting research the next five ten years, five years, is going to be around how you put enough information for the AI to have like common sense and then a domain expertise, like teaching English to kids, right, and build a small enough LLM to. Uh, to fit in your phone, right? To function as almost like a, in this case, a teacher, but something else, a assistant, etc. I think those are the actually more interesting applications that are going to come out, right? And and you don't see some of these big guys doing that. Yeah, they're trying to create mm. an omniscient kind of AI, which is you know, I, I think when they throw up. I think they're discovering when you throw so much information in the system, it actually is not very stable. <laughs> uh, well, they might stabilize it even at some point, but it won't fit into a phone. You know, it, right. it requires this huge cloud to run. Um, uh, so I'm not as worried about, you know, um, these big companies doing these things. Um, and there'll be lots of them. Right. Yeah. Uh, US will have probably a dozen of these yeah. LLMs, and China has. There's, there's three already going this, on. Yeah. you know, what people call the Chad GPT mafia. Yeah. The way we would have seen the PayPal mafia. Yeah. And they're all spreading. Yeah. They're yeah. all going to do different things. Yeah. And who knows, Singapore might have its own yeah. you know, generative AI system, you know, in different parts of Europe. And this is going to be a very common technology. It's like, Cloud tech, right? Right. Having cloud tech is no big deal now. You know, you can 
It's all open source. It's no big deal. If you want to build an AWS, for example, okay, you need to figure mm. out how to scale cloud tech to the you know millions and maybe billions of of nodes, right? Right. But uh, if you and I think that's what's going to happen with uh, these AI modules. And in fact, it's going to be more interesting because uh, cloud tech, you don't try to fit it in your phone, but you want to fit AIs into your phone. Mm. And that that's a very interesting design envelope that people optimize for too. Um, again, I'm just giving you all this different kind of perspectives to give you a sense of why I'm not as worried about monopolies coming out of yeah. uh, AI. I'm I'm not I'm not a complete dystopian or dystopianist, but I think conversationally people need to talk about these yes, issues. I agree. Right? Whether you're having a drink with somebody or you're in a classroom or you're at home having dinner with your yeah. family. I think people just need to, you know, infuse this into the cultural conversation. Yes. So that you bump into something and you raise this, you know, dude, I think you got to take a look at this. You yeah. know, we can't just unilateralize this. Pl plug it in. Yeah. 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 I, I, I want to add on a, on a utopian note, right? And back to the Southeast Asia, because this is where I think the Angsana Council can be hopefully of value to people in Southeast Asia and the world over. I think the baseline growth rate trajectory for Southeast Asia is probably five-ish yeah. percent. On average. Uh, that's just using conventional wisdom, brick and mortar, right? And then safe to say that high tech is probably not going to take place in a big way. We're going to be more users and enablers. We're not going to be creators for most parts of Southeast Asia. But then you take a look at this publication, right, on the cultivation of AI mm. economically, it's massive, yeah. it's staggering. Some would argue 30 trillion, some would argue 100 trillions in the next 10 to 15 years. Yeah. Boy, just imagine if we get to be in this cultivation mode. Chunk just, of yeah, just a chunk of this, just within logic, yeah. there's no reason for us not to be able to grow 10% per year. Yeah. You know, for the next two to three decades. Yeah. It's sort of like, what we've witnessed with most Asian or Southeast Asian countries in the 70s, 80s, yeah. and some parts of the 90s. Yeah. I, I think the, um, we did this on Sana Council report, right? That right. made the observation that the old strategy of forming Karetsu around manufacturing to mm. grow the GDP, to bootstrap out of emerging markets, is sort of the old way of doing it. Now we do manufacturing, but services is half our GDP, mm. right? So if we can double that, it's much faster than growing the, the manufacturing sector. So if you observe the services sector and how China has benefited from that, uh, frankly, half the GDP in China is services, right? 6.5 trillion or so. Most of that profit pool go to tech companies that didn't exist 25 years right. ago, right? So, and, and if you look at what happened in the U.S. decades before China, they, they, did, they digitized their services also, right? But uh, it was in the form of, you know, uh, mini computers, mainframes, and so the old school stuff, right? right? And then terminals, right? Like airline saver, you, you book through the terminals, and web 1.0, et cetera. Uh, China came along and started technifying when um, what was available was the the phone, if you look at the phone, you know, you've got all these apps on it. You click on the app, you open up a virtual control panel to this huge machinery. If you push the buttons in the right sequence, you get services coming to you, right? So that itself was enough to transform China, right? Um, hugely. We have that as we are technifying our services industry, which is half our GDP. But now we have AI. Right. What if you figure out the right ways to deploy AI in the technification of your services, right? We've conversations about how to shift that transactional thinking to a relational thinking about the businesses you build and how they create value, right? Not just from transacting, right? 
we, we all know there's something wrong with tech, right? Because the only thing that tech can automate today is a transaction, right? And so if you want to make more money as a tech company, you just speed up the transaction. Right. Human being becomes a factor of production. Right. Grab a human being, squeeze the transaction out, throw in a way. So we talk about six months or one year lifetime value of a human being, right? Which when the first time I had that conversation sort of was a bit disorienting. We live for a long time. Why are you talking about a six months lifetime value, right? It's because our technology couldn't support a, a, a bigger thinking about what that relationship should be about. Well, the technology that enables us to do that is here now, right? You can, you can actually start to talk to your customers, not with a human being, but with an AI and behave to them appropriately and right. build that relationship, right? So what if we took that capability and put it into our businesses, our services business, wow. and accelerate it to the next level, right? We call these things uh, virtual relationship managers. Yeah. They could be salespeople, they could yeah. be customers, but it doesn't matter. You know, it enables us to do things much better with our users. And not only do we get higher productivity, we get much better experiences as right. consumers, right? So I'm very, very excited. I'm talking to all my CEOs with services businesses to think in those terms, right? And so we might not generate some of the breakouts in AI, mm. but we'll generate the breakouts in the use of AI, I think yeah. over the next you know, five years. Uh, and you start seeing a an app where you don't need to click on your phone anymore. You just tell the app what to do. And or you just, just think it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. You know, let's see it's what the better, Elon Musk right? uh, neural link does. Yeah. Yeah. So when, when do you think We'll reach AGI. First of all, I'm not very sure what that is. Right? Okay. Uh, I don't think anyone has sort of a working definition of what AGI is. Um, I, I have this image of AI as, as being a very smart thing, but is built to serve us. Um, now, of course, the not so good competent people could do other things with it, right. right? And this is where I worry about AGI, right? if it falls into the wrong hands and is very, very capable, it can crack through all kinds of computer systems, and, you know, the, the scientific, uh, the sci-fi movie type stuff, right? I do worry about that, um, but I think we're quite a ways from it. The sign I'm looking for um, is, the first AI that creates an AI better than a human created AI. So man, that's scary. Yeah, it'll happen. I I think it'll be a while, but I'm not sure. We're supposed to end on a utopian note. <laughs> <laughs> you drove us there. <laughs> yeah, just but, think about that. That's wow. Yeah, but but if we build AIs in service of us, then it really will help us. Yeah. You know, some, some have said that the day, the minute AGI comes about, that's really the expiration date of our profession. Yeah, I mean, what, one way to look at... I mean, you know, I would tell the young people that, you know, you, you better look up a profession that doesn't have an expiration date, man. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, leader. <laughs> yeah. Right? Uh, well, that's, that's finite. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I, I think um, it might, the AGI might cause um, a lot of jobs to be destroyed. But I think it will also try to, it'll, it'll help us reconfigure our economic systems so that we have much more optionality um, as opposed to have to work. <coughs> I, I think the, the, challenges of capitalism is it assumes the value of labor is not zero. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And when you assume that and you automate everything. That's another episode, man. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. I mean, no, no, no. I mean, you, you got me, man. You got yeah. me going. Yeah. I mean, I think sooner rather than later, 
governments all across the world are going to be thinking about how to tax yeah. the, da the, the damn thing. Yeah, they need to figure this out because capital is going to create more and more of the value. I mm. mean, we, we see this in, yeah. in the economy now. Um, capital is going to be able to create more and more value and labor is going to create less and less of value. Right. Right. So if only like 3% of the people own the capital, you got a huge problem in society. Yeah. We've seen that. We're seeing that. Yeah. You know, issues that. with respect to redistribution of welfare. Yeah. And develop, developing and underdeveloped. You, you know I've thought about this quite a bit, but mm. the, the solutions are not obvious. The, this is one of the areas where I'm, I'm more concerned about. I mean, you need more heart than brain. Yeah. Yeah, e even if you don't have to do anything, AIs can do any everything for mm. you. What's your life about? Yeah. Right. It's just basic stuff of yeah. meaning needs to be talked about. Right. Uh, so it's a very interesting set of problems. My belief is uh, most people alive today will live through that transition point. I think the, 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 you, frankly, you don't even need AGI to get to a lot of it. Right. Because a lot of what we do in terms of labor is not that intellectual yeah it's not that. will we see asi in our lifetime artificial super intelligence <laughs> it's a guess right? if i were to give you an answer it's a guess uh one, once you hit that exponential when the ai starts to create an ai it's it incremental just, yeah it, it, it's because yeah. it, it'll happen at silicon yeah. right now the ais are built by human beings so yeah. it's kind of slow going yeah right once the ai has figured out i can build an ai better than myself Right. At some point, we let go and the AI keeps running. Right. That's when you start walking the dog and you know, <laughs> sip your coffee at the beach. Yeah. Let's hope. Right. It, yeah. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Any final thoughts or messages? Okay. You know, it, it's it's the old curse or wish that we live in interesting times. Right. And uh, I think we live in very very interesting time. I. I I'm so glad to be alive at this point in history, right? The, the, everything's about to change all over again, right? I mean, yeah. um, and, and I'm, you know, I'm an optimist and I think, uh, a lot of it is going to be changing for the better. Yeah. Yeah. But we, we need to be thoughtful of how, how we get there. Let's pray yeah. for that. <laughs> Thank you so much, Bang. Thank you. Yeah. Man, teman, itulah Peng Ong. Founder dan pimpinan dari Mongsil Ventures. Terima kasih. Inilah Endgame.